tutors that he was a second Achilles fancied himself in the role. On the other hand, there was Daddy, who clearly had prior claim to the job, and now Daddy had remarried and was busy siring children on Cleopatra as fast as he could go. Growing tension between family members comes to a head on the couple's wedding night in the fall of 338 BC. The Macedonians were renowned for their drinking parties, many of which took place right here in the palace. Following the wedding of Philip and Cleopatra, the traditional Macedonian banquet takes place, at which all the men become seriously drunk. Atalus, the bride's uncle, raises a toast, praying that the gods may bless the union with the legitimate heir to the throne. Enraged, Alexander shouts out, what do you take me for, a bastard? He hurls a goblet of wine at Atalus. Philip stands, draws his sword, advances across the room towards his son. But he's so drunk that he trips and falls. Alexander jeers at his father, saying, here is the man who is planning to cross from Europe into Asia, and he cannot even cross from one table to another. This incident devastates a father-son relationship, which took 18 years to build. It destroys the potential of a military partnership upon which family dynasties are often founded. Following the scandalous wedding banquet, Alexander and his mother Olympias go into exile. But Philip soon realizes that the state needs a recognized heir to the throne, and he needs a valuable military commander. He convinces Alexander to return home. But Olympias does not return. Despite the reconciliation, there is no guarantee that Alexander will one day be king. Within a year of Philip's marriage, Cleopatra gives birth to a son. If Philip lives long enough, the throne will not go to Alexander. It will go to his half-brother, a purebred Macedonian. While the intense discord among Philip, Alexander and Olympias is far from reconciled, Philip now focuses on his ultimate goal. With Greece under control, he considers expanding his kingdom into Asia. Philip sends a small expedition of troops under the command of his general Parmenio to Asia's western coast to assess obstacles and establish a bridgehead. Parmenio was his senior general, extremely important to him. He was his right-hand man, absolutely trusted. He was also a conniving political bastard of the first order, and his great advantage, clearly, was A, his absolute loyalty to Philip, and B, his undoubted extreme skill as a general. But before Philip himself risks the journey to Asia, he decides once again to consult the gods. Philip sends an emissary to Delphi to ask whether or not he will conquer Darius, the great king of Persia. The answer he receives is ambiguous. The bull is garlanded, the sacrifice is ready. Philip interprets this to mean that Darius will be slaughtered like a victim at the altar. The true fulfillment of the prophecy, however, turns out to be quite different. Straight away, Philip sets in motion plans for gorgeous sacrifices. He wanted as many Greeks as possible to take part in the festivities, so he planned brilliant musical contests and lavish banquets for his friends and guests. He was determined to show himself to the Greeks as an amiable person. Philip's celebration takes place on the palace grounds of the ancient capital city of Aegae. It is October of 336 BC. This is the theater in the grounds of the royal palace at Aegae. Here, thousands of Macedonians gather, together with King Philip and Alexander, for a festival in honor of the gods. Yeah. 
It's a happy occasion for all, except one man, Pausanias, a royal bodyguard. According to the ancient historian Diodorus, Pausanias is beloved by Philip because of his beauty. But when the king becomes enamored of another young man, Pausanias reacts poorly. He accuses the young man of being a promiscuous hermaphrodite. For this, Pausanias is punished. He is plied with wine until drunk. Unconscious, he is thrown to the king's mule drivers to abuse and drunken licentiousness. Later, he complains to Philip about this abuse, but the king takes no action against those responsible. In anger, Pausanias runs up to Philip, stabs him, and runs off. But he is killed before making his escape. Alexander rushes to his father, but it's too late. Philip dies in 336 BC. Conspiracy theories are immediately considered. Could Philip's wife, Olympias, have been involved to assure her son Alexander inheriting the throne? Could Alexander himself have played a role in planning the assassination? While such issues are investigated, an even more important question of urgency must be decided. Will Greece accept Alexander as its king? King Philip of Macedon is killed in 336 BC. There is no doubt that his own bodyguard dealt the fatal blow. But as with modern day murders attributed to lone assassins, questions arise about others being involved in the assassination plot. Conspiracy theories were thought of right from the beginning, particularly after Pausanias himself uh, was very conveniently assassinated uh, during the chase by Alexander's oldest school friends, which would have made it impossible for him to talk. The immediate suspicion fell on Olympias and through Olympias on Alexander, and the truth we're never going to know. After a ceremonial cremation, Philip's bones and most precious personal possessions are placed inside an elaborate burial chamber, which is then covered with tons of soil. By ancient custom, the higher the mound, the more important the person. Centuries later, archaeologists would consider this fact when deciding where first to dig in an area of Vergina, Greece, not far from the ancient royal palace at Aegi. This is where King Philip II was buried, near his palace, underneath a man-made mound of earth which has become known as the Great Tumulus. The tomb itself remained hidden for more than 2,000 years until discovered in 1977 by the Greek archaeologist Manolis Andronikos. Fifteen years later, a magnificent museum was built, literally, inside the tumulus. The Vergina Museum is a marvel of modern architecture and design, exquisitely exhibiting the items found in several tombs. This is the burial chamber of Philip II. When I first heard of this discovery, I could hardly believe it, and nor could many archaeologists. No Macedonian tomb on this scale had ever been discovered, but here it is. The facade is designed like a temple, a marble entrance flanked by two half columns or pilasters. Above the entrance is a frieze with the painting of a royal hunt. Philip is depicted hunting lion, boar and other wild animals in a Macedonian forest. Here, 